this, uh, this, this, I'm just, I don't know what we're just going to go here and we'll, we'll, we'll do what we do. All right. Brother Hagen was in the middle of the healing revival. But he was just one of, he was just, he was, he was not very popular. As a matter of fact, a lot of people didn't like his ministry. They, they rejected his ministry, didn't like what he taught. Now, who was at the height of the ministry during that time? Or Roberts, William Branham, Jack Cole. All those guys were big names. I mean, Brother Hagin had meetings of 500 people. They'd have meetings of 20,000 people. Does that mean he wasn't called? He wasn't anointed? He wasn't the call of God? No, 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 no. His, his latter days were his bigger days. If you know, Brother Roberts kind of did. Now, listen, yeah, listen, I'm not saying anything about Brother Roberts. Negative. That's not what I'm saying. You know? But his, his, big, his big days were back in the 50s, and he kind of became a back burner scene kind of thing. And then dad rose, and I'm trying to talk to you. Timing with the Lord doesn't, you know, doesn't mean because somebody's big and you're not, meaning that you're not going to do something. So I'm trying to make the point up. When Brother Roberts was huge, Brother Hagin was small. They, they were friends, and they, they, walked in the, you know, they, they walked in the power of God and so forth. But I'm telling you, he was, he, Brother Hagin didn't have a 20,000 seat tent. Hello? Are you here? You're going home. But then when Brother Roberts' ministry seemed to, seemed to fade, Brother Hagin's took off and got big. I'd go to camp meeting. They'd have 18, 19,000, 20,000 people, 22,000 people register for camp meeting later in his ministry. So what am I trying to point out? You can't compare yourselves with somebody else because of where they are right now because this may be their heyday, spiritually speaking, and yours is coming. And it's not time for you. See, it was time for Brother Roberts when he did it. That was the, that was the right time. You understand? I'm not, I'm not being negative. I'm not saying that he was, you know, he was a shooting star and he flashed. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about timing. There are timings in the things of God. And just because you're not where so-and-so is right now, you can't get competitive or comparative because they that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. What do you do? Abraham. Think about Abraham now. Abraham had, had a promise that took 25 years years to come to pass. 25. And that was just to get him here. When he was 13, 38 years later, God told him to go kill him and offer him as a sacrifice. Hello? Y'all hear you've gone home. And sometimes we get so up caught up with, you know, hungry jack blessings. Instant potatoes. Now, let me tell you something, folks. Hungry jacks are okay. There ain't nothing like taking out a bag of potatoes, peeling them, putting them in water, boiling them, mashing them up, putting in a stick of butter. Yeah, I said butter. I don't even forget that hydrogenized uh, margarine mess. Fake stuff. Butter. I mean, cow churned butter. Amen. Put in some heavy whipping cream. Stir those bad boys up with some salt in them. How do they, you just can't, and listen, I don't care what you do to Hungry Jack, it, it still comes out a wallpaper paste consistency. That's just how they are. We get Christians who get so caught up, I'm ministering to people right now, you, you just tune, I'm not, I'm not just up here talking, I'm not feeding the plants. Our plants are artificial, they don't need feeding. I'm talking to some people here right now, by the Holy Ghost. You need to step back and get into rest and stop comparing yourselves and stop wondering why you're not a certain size financially or a certain size business-wise or a certain this or a certain that and see what somebody else is doing and how great they're doing, you know, and stop looking at them. And I am telling you, get back into resting with God and walking with Him and being led by the Spirit, glory to God, and letting Him direct your path, hallelujah, and you walk out the plan of God looking at Him, looking unto Jesus, not at what someone else is doing. We got too many churches right now who are copying what somebody else is doing because they got people in the doors, and I'm telling you, they miss God because they gave up the Word and the Holy Ghost to do it. And they weren't willing to walk with God and do what God said and walk in the voice of the Spirit. They just wanted the butts in the seats. Well, that's what they got, butts in the seats. Everything they do is a butt but we don't like that, but we don't want this, but we can't have that. Pastor, you shouldn't say that in church. Buttocks in the seats. 
Butts is easier. All right. Amen. Too many are going to keep looking to what the hottest, newest, latest bread is, what somebody's book was about. Instead of getting into the Spirit, getting into rest, hearing the voice of God, walking in the place with God, doing what God said, the way God said it, how God said it. I, tell people, I told this to the Raymond students when I was there. I said, what do you, how do you measure success? By the number of people you have? I said, no. You measure success by, am I doing what God said? Am I doing it how God said to do it? And am I doing it where God said to do it? If you got three people, those are your, those are your criteria, you're doing that, you're successful. I don't believe that. You gotta go to, can't go to churches less than 5,000 people because you got to maximize your ministry. I'm glad that Philip didn't listen to that teaching. Because Philip left a citywide revival and went out to the desert and found one eunuch on a chariot out there and preached Christ to him and got him born again and baptized in water. I think he maximized his ministry. What do you think? Why? Because he did what the Lord said to do, how God said to do it, and where God said to do it. What's God telling you? What has God, what has God told you that you got frustrated with because it didn't happen in a certain timetable? Now I'm getting a whole lot of cow at Newgate looks right here, right now. Dog at a new bowl. Are you here? You better go back to where God said that you got frustrated over and quit and went somewhere else. And settle. Settle in peace. Settle in the spirit. I know, I, I, I'm here I'm here in the spirit right now. There are people that are thinking right now, I don't want to go back there because it's such a place of frustration. That's why you haven't gone anywhere else. Because you didn't deal with that there. And the spirit of God's telling you right now, get your back in back over there. Deal with that. Get into peace about that and go forward from there. That's to be kind of strong. You got that right because I mean, you, you're not going to be successful. You're not going to make it until you do. You're just going to keep spinning your wheels. So you're going to keep spinning your wheels. Hello. I can tell you there's countless. Can I say this? Are you putting this on the internet? Eh. There are so many people that should left the church that's never supposed to left, and they're somewhere spinning their wheels thinking they're okay, and they've missed God. And it's not because I'm some great one. There's a purpose God has for this church they were supposed to be a part of. And they keep spinning their wheels, thinking they're making it, and they're just they're just running in place. They're on a treadmill. The, the scenery on a treadmill never changes. Now, sometimes I'll use treadmills just because it's easier on your knees and that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, I hate treadmills. They're boring. You know what I'm talking about? You go outside and walk and the scenery changes. You get to run from dogs. Hello? You get to see people break into people's houses, call the police. I mean, it's a lot more exciting. Stop walking on treadmills and get back to walking with God in the plan of God. Hallelujah. Father, I thank Help us, Lord, walk in all that you planned for us. Help us to see the detours or plant places we've missed it and get back on the right track. Get back to that place where we can rest in you and rest in your purpose and not be uptight about how long or what somebody else is doing, but just walk in that peace of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'll, I'll tell you something. Jane is going to show it over there to the kids this morning. But the kid, the girl sent us a link of this tribe somewhere getting Bibles. Has anybody seen that? And the pastor. Oh, my, 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 my. I'm just telling you. The pastor takes the Bibles and holds them up to God. And make, it'll make you weep. It's the whole tribe came out in celebration to meet the airplane bringing their Bibles in their language. For the very first time they had the Bible, the New Testament in their language. And here come the plane landing and they're dancing and they're all excited and they bring the Bibles up and hold them up to God. And you can, he's, listen to this. 
Oh, I wish we could play it. So let me go ask my wife if, if there's a way that we could play that on our on our system. Oh my! I, I, we, we just have to. We might have to wait. This is what God's trying to talk to us about right now. We're getting stuff on the internet about how we don't need the written word and how it's not that important and how just being led by the Spirit. And here's a try. This this man says that he, just like Simeon in the temple could now die because he saw the Messiah. He had seen when he held those Bibles in his hand the end of his faith and work for his people. Oh my. And we get uptight because we don't have a Cadillac this week. We didn't get that $400,000 house. We didn't get that gold ring or whatever. He's weeping. He's, like, he's all but weeping and, and crying out to God. I've done my work. Here is the end. Of my, it wasn't a car. And it wasn't a house. And it wasn't another a, a, a vacation home. It was Bibles. The end of his faith. The end of his work. Bibles and his people's language. And it's one of those things for, for America. We slap right upside the head with a case of them. We get so caught up with prosperity. And I believe in prosperity. But I am telling you. Look at the heart of the man. He doesn't care if he has a Cadillac. He doesn't care. He don't care if he has ever, ever has a motor vehicle. All he's cared about was his people having the word of God in their language. My, 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 my. Oh, my. I think there has to be a change in how we think. There has to be a change in how we approach life. Our, our, our home is 2,000 square feet and brother so-and-so's is 4,000 square feet and we're jealous. How can this be? And brother Bill, did, did you get anything? Oh, here comes my wife. We won't have sound? Bill, can somebody take over the camera for Bill? Yeah, the words are in English. It's, it's subtitles. There's no, there's, no, there's no English on it. It's just, you can still see the excitement on our face. I just kind of wish we could hear it too. I just wonder if we could switch the, uh, the, the audio to the other computer and get the audio. That sound card does not work. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, I got it. You've already got it set up. It's on your computer, right? All right, I ain't going to mess up this whole service. <laughs> Go bring your computer over here. We're going to hook it up to the monitors and plug in the sound thing. Somebody go help my wife. All right. Bro, somebody take over the camera from Brother Bill. He's, a, he's my guru here.
This is what the kingdom of God is about. It's not about, listen, I believe in prosperity, but I'm telling you, it's not about what kind of car you drive and how big your house is. It's God has given us the power to get wealth that we may establish his covenant in the earth. We have to be covenant establishers. Hallelujah. Anybody get blessed by seeing that? I'm telling you how precious the Word of God is. How precious the Word of God is. And people will, right here in America, will go sit themselves under a church that doesn't preach the Word because it placates their soul. And these people are, live, are, are, are all but dying to get the Word. How blessed you are to be in a church that refuses to compromise God's Word. And there's nothing more important, nothing more important than being in that place where you get ministered the Word and the Spirit. That's greater than anything else you'll ever do. Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay. I, just, I sense this whole church has been moved by that one little short video. The heart, the heart of those people that they got their Bibles. Most of you got 10, 12 sitting around the house somewhere. The whole, I mean, the Old and New Testament. They're going to pass it around. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna get a certain number of people going to get them and they're going to pass them down. And, and now they become a, ha a family, a treasure to pass from grandmother to daughter to granddaughter to 
to perpetuate having the word of God. Did you see what they said? They'll pass it to their children to keep them on the path of righteousness. They know the value of what they've got. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, it got quiet after that one. You know, sometimes it's good to do a little soul searching, isn't it? Yeah. Sometimes it's good to look at your life and say, you know, am I, is my heart right? Is my heart right? Amen. Let's turn the lights on. Go ahead and get your Bibles out. Hallelujah. We've been teaching on. Hallelujah. I'll be honest with you, if some of us would learn to rest. Go to the fourth chapter of the book of Philippians. <laughs> I can't go that way. Philippians, fourth chapter. Brother Larry, if you'll find the Weymouth translation. I, I, actually, do you have 20th century up there? Do you have 20th century? Find 20th century. Philippians chapter 4, we'll get down to verse 11 or so, but also if you can pull up Weymouth, can you set both of them up at the same time? Put up Weymouth. Therefore, my beloved, verse 1, dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech you, Didas, you, you Didas, Beseech uh, Synthike, that they may be of the same mind in the Lord, and I treat the, also the true yoke fellow. Help those women which labor with me in the gospel. With Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious or careful or worry about nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. There's a whole list here. Not just true, but is it honest? Is it, is it lovely? Is it of a good report? There are some things that are true you don't need to think on. Yeah, right. Go ahead. There's a lot of things that are true you don't need to think on. It's not just true. There's a lot of things he adds to that, that whole uh, uh, delineation of, of subject matter here to make a statement of what to think on. And truth is not just truth or truth, things that are true. Now, when we're talking about truth as God's word. That, that covers all these. <clears throat> but you know, Manson um, serial killed X number of people listening to Helter Skelter. He was a freak, carved things into their skin with knives and stuff. He's a, he was, he's demon possessed. All right, you don't need to think on that. All right, although it may be true, he did it. You don't need to think on it. It's not lovely and it's not good. Okay, um, there has to be praise in it. What praise to God? Those things which you've both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. Paul said, I'm an example you can follow. We at ministers, I'm talking to ministers, you're listening, those of you listening on the internet and, and uh, via our webcast and our video cast around the world and through, the, through uh, the internet radio station we're on. You need to live a life that your flock and people that you minister to can follow. You need to be an example that others can follow. Now, I don't know how many people I've heard you know, come back and told us, even people who've left our church, that how we parent and how we brought our children up has been an example and a guide to them. Sure. Hello? Yeah. Now, the girls are at Rama. I'm not just saying, you know, listen, they're at Rama. Nathan's already told me, he told me about two months ago, he's supposed to go. I didn't, I, I've never pushed any of them. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I, I tell them, you better make sure you know it's God telling you because I can't call you. Because you get in the middle of a crisis out there, I can't help it. You can't come back to me and go, you told me to go. Uh -huh. I wouldn't even talk to Nathan about it. Hello? 
Are my kids perfect? Of course not. Who's are? But we brought them up in the way of the Lord. Hallelujah. I think we're good examples. We need to be good examples. Ministers. Ministers, you need to be a good example. Hallelujah. Leaders in the church, you need to be good examples. I had somebody come to church one time. The first thing they told me is, I don't believe in spanking. Well, I do. Hello? Met somebody on the parkway yesterday. I thought they need to spank. They couldn't take a family picture because the kids, and they try, oh, now come over here, honey. Come. Yeah, if they don't listen to you at all, you ain't been doing nothing at home. I don't believe in spanking. Well, the Bible says he who spares the rod hates his child. I don't know if I like you, but I want to run with Bible company. Well, I think it teaches your child to hit. Baloney. Bovine excrement. <laughs> Hello. That's just the world. Are you here? Y'all got that, didn't you? <laughs> That's just the world. The world says don't spank. The world says, you know, you'll break their spirit. You got to break that rebellious thing. Yeah. Yeah. My God. We got a whole generation of rebellious people draining a whole nother generation of rebellious people. But the second generation is rebellion on steroids. Uh, anyway. Say help me Jesus or help, or help pastor. We need to be good examples. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, and now at your last care, and, and, and now at the last, your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but lacked opportunity. Now, not that I speak, speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatever state I'm in, in therewith to be content. Now, the uh, new, 20th century New Testament says, da -da 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 -da. So then, my dear brothers, whom I am longing to see, who you are my crown, joy and crown, hold fast and dear union, where are we? Where verse are we in there? I need verse 11. And we're going to verse 11. Do not think I'm under pressure for say, uh, saying this for the pressure of want. For I am placed, however, for however I am placed, have learned to be independent of the circumstances. Paul said, I've, been, I've learned to be independent of the circumstances. Now the next verse goes on and says, I know how to, how to be a base and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I, now I, I have looked and look, I found this in a translation one time somewhere, cannot find it. I have looked for four years. And it's irritating me that I didn't write it down somewhere, so I'll go back to it. But this verse says in one, in, in one place, either, either in a paraphrase or a, um, a commentary or a translation, I just can't find it. And I want to find it so I can, I can, you know, give you the reference to it. But it said this. It says, I know how to abound, I mean to be abased and not lose my poise. I know how, to, or he says, I know, how not, I know how to live with lack and not lose my poise. I know how to live with too much and not lose my head. Good. And, uh, and he says, I've learned that wherever I am, I'm independent of the circumstances. It doesn't matter if I've got too much or not enough. I'm the same. Because I'm independent of the circumstances. My joy, my walk with God, my daily life, my spiritual life, the way I conduct myself, the things that I say are not based on what the bank account says and what the bill pile says. It's based on the fact that I'm born of God. He's in me. I'm in him. I'm always the same. I'm living independent of the circumstances. But Paul didn't say that he did this by some greatness of Paul because the next verse says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I know I'm not on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but that's okay because the Holy Ghost led us this way. And since he led us this way, it's his sermon, not mine anyway. He's talking to folks. I said, he's talking to folks. He's talking to you. Trying to make a point to you. Trying to get you to wake up. There's junk going on all around the world. I just paid $4.07 a gallon for gasoline yesterday. They got me. It was three ninety nine nine, And then I started pumping and looked down and it said credit price four oh seven. dollars They got me for $0.08 cents a gallon. Actually, they probably got me for $0.88 cents a gallon. Yeah. Somebody's getting me for a lot of money. Yeah. Now, I had a point right there I could have lost my joy. And I thought about it for a couple seconds. 
I mean, three ninety nine nine is as close to four as you can get without have hitting four. And I guarantee, if you went and pumped one dollar four one gallon precisely on the nose, it still ring up four, because they can't give you a tenth of a penny back. So you're paying four dollars a gallon. <coughs> Hello, about I don't know seventy eighty cents of that is North Carolina taxes. Yeah. Just so you'll know, just so you can feel good. Yeah. In January and in July, the tax on our gas is based on the price of wholesale gas at that time. So from January to July, whatever it was on January 1 is the price of the tax. And the tax is based on a formula based on the price of wholesale. Which means if gas is up at that time, the tax goes up and stays up no matter what the gas does that whole next six months. Yeah. So if it drops a dollar a gallon, you're still going to be paying the same tax as if it was the other price. Yeah. That's how it works. In our state. Yeah. Hallelujah. So I, you know, I didn't see that little credit sign until after I was pumping. And I looked down and said, 407 9. <laughs> and I thought, it's better than walking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you gotta think about it. And then I then what didn't really help me any as I rode down the road two miles, and there it was for 385 9. <laughs> credit or cash. But all I could say was I wasn't empty. I was only half. So I put a half tank in there. About 10 gallons. So they got me for about $2.20. Okay. But if I lived there, they wouldn't get my business. Ever. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But circumstance, listen, we, we all know things are tight. Things are tough. Things are rough all around the place in the natural. But are we going to be independent of the circumstances or not? We can do all things through Christ. Right. Amen. Oh, baby, I'm telling you, it can look rough. Are you here? Or are you going home? No. I mean, I've got a son graduating from high school in a month, and he's going to be going into college. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, amen. amen. Yes, amen. Yes, double amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, and I've already put two girls through college, uh -huh. and now they're at Rama. So we're putting them through Rama. What would you, I mean, would you, wouldn't you like to, I'd like to have all that, wouldn't I just like to have all my kids paid for and done, them, and they're all got their own incomes and stuff, and I'm just living, you know, nice and laid back and not all this, you know what, but you know what, I made a choice to bring them into the world, and they came out of college until in the time of the economy is, is not marvelous, so we're helping them get through to where they need to be, and I'm just, you know what, that's okay, that's okay, that's all right. The end of my faith will be the, in, in, in family life, will be the prosperity of my children and them walking in things God has for them. I'm, I'm going to share something. Uh, Dean Tad just called him into his office on Friday. Yeah, and, and he had a big, long talk with him, about an hour meeting with the girls. And because uh, when I was at I said, he, I said, listen, they don't, they don't promote themselves. They don't share a lot about themselves, but you need to, you need, you need to understand. They graduated from an up-and-coming university. They were college ambassadors. They won the campus activity team. They sat down. They're starting a, an ambassador program at Rama, where, where they have students with, with ambassador shirts and stuff and train, take people on tours throughout, and the girls are heading it up. The girls are going to develop it, put it together, work with Dean Tad and, the, and another person, and then before camp meeting, they'll present it to Sister Lynette for budgeting. Wow. And they're heading it up. Amen. Wow. Hallelujah. And they're going to be involved in, in creating campus activities all next year because they, they, they know the campus life at Rama is, is, is too, it ain't there. It doesn't exist. I mean, their biggest thing is you get to get the basketball games. What if you don't like basketball? And it's just, it's just it's never been about, you know, a high priority because it's been a Bible training center. They're trying to create a, a, a campus life that makes the experience all, a whole experience. Yeah. You know? And uh, they're going to be involved in helping set that up. Amen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're so, we're so excited for them. You know? I mean, they, they got the, the shirts and they're going to, I mean, all, they're going to put the, the manual together. They're going to do the training. They're going to be doing stuff at camp meeting, keep, taking people on tours at, at the campus during camp meeting. They're just so excited. Listen. We're glad that we can get, we're, we're, we're at a place where we're giving back yeah. Yeah. in a way that we didn't know we'd ever give back. Right. Amen. Kids are doing things that you wish you could have done to help the school, but they're doing it. Yeah. So we're excited. It's great, yeah. Nathan, well, he, obviously he's not here today, but uh, their choral team was, was in competition this weekend in, down in Atlanta. And they were, the awards were at Six Flags. In other words, they did the competition over the double tree, and then the awards were handed out yesterday. Their choral team won gold and won the whole thing. Wow. 
That's the group that Dathan's in. Ah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we're, you know, we're seeing our kids blessed. And there are things that are more important than how much money you got. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what I, what I like, that's, I'm not saying I don't believe in prosperity. Right. But sometimes we get our eye on people living a certain way and we want to live that instead of walking a plan out where God has for us. You're going to end up at a certain place. But I'm going to tell you, stop looking at how so and so is getting there. Yeah. And how you're getting there and comparing them. <coughs> you got to live independent of the circumstances. You're going to have to live by faith. There are people doing stuff that are not living by faith. They're not walking in the plan of God. And it looks like it is. Uh-huh. Right. Some of the biggest, the biggest healing tent guy died at 38 because he didn't walk in love. Called Brother Roberts at 4 o'clock in the morning and said, I just bought a, a section that will seat 2,000 more than your tent. I can now seat 22,000. You seat 20. I got a bigger tent than you. He died at 38 because he couldn't walk in love. What, a gift snuffed out because he was arrogant and pride and not walking in love. Oh, but he had a gift. Yeah. <clears throat> how, and see, how, how come he had that healing gift and he died because he didn't walk in love? Yeah. It wasn't about who had the biggest tent. That was, never, that was never the issue to begin with. But you were in competition. Got out of love. See, you got to live independent of the circumstances. So what if you've got your seats 18,950 and their seats 20,000? Who cares? you got 18,950 people to get ministered to. Instead of, doggone it, Brother Robert said 20,000. i got to get bigger one than him so I can have more people than him so I can brag i got the biggest tent. Yeah, now you stuffed your ministry out of 38 instead of living to, to 60, 70, 80 years old. How many years did the people didn't, how many thousands of people didn't get ministered to because yeah. you didn't walk in love and couldn't be independent of your circumstances? Hello? How many people didn't get ministered to? Because the day you died, that 22,000 tent was empty. Yeah. Forever. Somebody here, y'all go home. Brother Hagin said at 81, he said, I'm, out, I'm still out there, and they're all gone. They've all died. Said Brother Roberts, who went talking about him, but all the other ones had died off. Got arrogant, got into error. Mm -hmm. Wanted to do something they weren't called to do. Oh, yeah. We had people leave the church when we bought our house. Got mad because of the size of our house. What they don't know is the whole time we had our small, we, we went years and didn't have a house. We rented for years. And then when we did buy a house, we bought a house that appreciated real quick because it, were just, it just did. And we always paid extra every month. We walked out with a hunk of money. Not because we cheated, but because we just paid a little extra every month and our house greatly appreciated. It appreciated about $30,000. Thank God. From the time we bought it. Well, that's, and we were paying just a little bit more than we were paying for rent when we bought the thing. And we had it for, uh, I don't know, nine, 10 years or so, close to that. And we always paid extra every month, so that kept reducing the rate. So by the time we got done, the, 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 the principal left was low, and it appreciated. We had a nice hunt, and then our builder had lowered our house by $60,000. Because he's he trying to get rid of it, sat on the market for a year. Yeah. So th then we had sixty to seventy, seventy-two thousand. 72000 we put on our new house out of our pocket. 130000 that brings it way down. Well, see, people don't know that, but they just look, oh, look at that size of that house. Yeah. They don't know we were wise stewards all those years. Yeah. Right. And being smart. It, it looks, I, yes, it's a blessing of the Lord, but it's also being a good steward, too. Yeah. We were wise during that time. Right. And what you know, we've been doing the same thing in this house. We've been paying extra every month. Every, extra every month. Why? Because I don't want to pay for the house 30 years. And by paying the extra every month, we, we've got it down to a 20-year note. Yeah. Well, that's good. But people, somebody, some people left the church. Oh, that's great. See you later. Well, well I wouldn't, we, we weren't going to buy, we weren't going to buy, actually, we looked at that house a year before and, didn't, and said, now we don't like it. And tried to buy a cheaper house and that didn't work out. We ended up paying about, that year later, not much more for the bigger, nicer house than we would have paid for the other one. That's great. Because of how everything worked out, because he lowered the price and all that kind of stuff. We were going to buy a cheaper house. But yeah, you can't get comparisons about, about, about on yourself. No. No, not at all. 
Well, so-and-so, look at what kind of car they drive. Well, I'm going to tell you sometimes you better, you, you don't even know why they're driving that kind of car. They may be leased to the wazoos. Uh-huh. They just drive, you know, I remember the day that, Brother Bill remembers, the prosperity tie. Yeah. Whenever so-and-so on his particular over-the-air network satellite thingy, every month they had a meeting and he'd wear a tie. And the next month all the pastors that associated with that had that tie because that was the power tie. Yeah. Tie ain't got nothing to do with it. <laughs> Someone walked by the platform one day with a husband. Cope was up on the platform and said, Oh, that's what you need a pair of socks like that. You'll preach better. Wow. <laughs> socks ain't got nothing to do with how you preach. <laughs> Dad Hague was telling a story one time about this fella. He had uh, gotten somewhere to preach, and the, the family he was staying with wanted to eat him to eat supper. He said, No, I never eat before I, before I preach. I preach better when I don't eat. And so that night, the, the wife didn't go to church that night, but the, the, the man in the home took him to church and brought him back, and they were laying in bed. He could hear him through the wall. And the wife said, how'd he do? He said, he could have ate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't have hurt him a bit to have eaten supper. <laughs> of course, Gina thinks I preach better when I eat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Glory to God. Paul said, I've learned to be independent of the circumstances. We've got to stop looking what's around us and look to God. Hebrews, the, fourth, the 12th chapter says, looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Amen. Have a fixed gaze. Are y'all here? Yeah. Wherefore we are seen, we are composed about by uh, such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside the weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race of patience. Oh my God, if we could just learn that in patience possess ye your souls. We get so antsy. People quit. I'm telling you, people have quit when the answer was walking up their steps because yeah. they got antsy and couldn't wait any longer. Mm. Now, I, I listen, I, I'm not saying this to be critical. I'm not saying this to, to bring up something. But I had someone tell me that they left the church one time. They said, I can't tell you the Lord told me to leave. I just decided uh, no guts, no glory, and so I jumped. That was, that's what they told me. No guts, no glory, and so I jumped. Now, listen, we love, I love them. I love their family. But that's not how you do that. And I'm not saying that because, you know, and I, I don't want you to try to figure out who it was. That's not the point. Those of you who might, which we have figured out, I don't want you to try to figure out who it was. My point is this. We've got to be patient in the things of God. Yeah. And sometimes there can be a lot of voices speaking to us trying to get us out of our patience. But the Bible says, impatience possess ye your souls. Oh, yeah, but it's so good where I went. Well, maybe so, but it may not. Hey, listen, so good where you went may not be the glory of where you were supposed to be. And then we get two totally different things. God loves people. He'll bless them. He'll bless them even in partial disobedience if he can. Are y'all here? You're going home. Ishmael was a disobedient act on Abraham's part. But when he cried out to God, God said, I'll, I've heard your voice, I'll bless him. It wasn't his plan. Hello? Mm -hmm. So God, God loves people. God wants to help people. God wants to minister life to people. And if they, when they make mistakes or they go the wrong way or they do things that he really didn't plan, he'll bless them as much as he can because he loves them. So we, we get up caught up with, well, they're doing great. We all, that, that means it was God. That don't mean anything. It just means God loves them. Yeah. And he does. And I love them. And I want them blessed. And I want them to do well. All, everybody. But let's, let's you know, back it up. Let's not get a no guts, no glory attitude and just make a jump just because we're, we become impatient about something. Hello. I'm not going to speak cursing on somebody damnation on somebody because they've, they've done something. I want them blessed. I want them to prosper. I want good things to happen to them. Amen? On the other hand, though, let's learn and not make mistakes. Let's not do stupid things. Let's not make a decision based on the fact we couldn't remain patient. Be 
patient, therefore, brother, unto the coming of the Lord. What did the Bible say? Because the husband, that's over in James, isn't it? Because the husbandman waiteth. Or is it James? Somebody help me out there. Is that James? Yeah, James. Because the husbandman waiteth. And what does it say? And hath long patience. Oh my. We could learn a couple things from the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all here, you go home. Hath long. Look, look at over there, James. Get over there. I said, get on over to James. Hallelujah. Chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it till they receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye also, uh oh, learn something from the Lord. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Think about that now. He's giving you an example of the way of, of the long suffering and patience of the Lord and says, Be you also patient. So we keep getting want to run out ahead of stuff. And we keep getting told and we, we keep going to seminars and we keep getting books on 10 steps to being the biggest church in town or, you know, I mean, 14 steps to being the most profound Christian on the planet. You know, uh, you know, um, having a kind of driven life. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't recommend certain books that use paraphrases as their foundational text. Especially when they take parts of a paraphrase verse and part of another paraphrase verse and put them together to make a verse to make their point. Because when you take them apart, they don't say what they made them say. I don't, I don't recommend certain things like that. I don't recommend things that you can't, that, that aren't. It's one thing to use a paraphrase to add light. It's another to use it as your point. Yeah. Hello. And that's as far as I'm going with that. Anyway. <laughs> we're all, we, we hear somebody, oh yeah, you're going to have supernatural debt cancellation. Give them, put pocket money in my, in my pocket. Hallelujah. And you're going to be rich next week. <laughs> you just entered your bank account $300. What's wrong with doing the old-fashioned tithing and giving to the local church and having line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, God giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater and multiplying your seed sown over time? We want all next week. We want a Hungry Jack style. We want to get out the instant potatoes, the milk, the, the water, the butter, the salt, put it on the stove, pour it together, and have some paste. All right, now I'll have it. <laughs> now, the only way I really eat instant mashed potatoes is if I mix them half and half. And that's not bad that way because you, you can mix them half and half and, and that works. It, it does work. It makes your, it makes your homemade a little creamier and smoother, but it, it, it doesn't paste up on you. <laughs> Hallelujah. You just got, yeah, I mean, did you not know that you come to church and get the Holy Ghost and a cooking lesson at the same time? Yeah. <laughs> We know. We <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm telling you, you just don't know what you're going to get at Faith of Victor Church, but I can tell you it'll be good. <laughs> my brothers and my sisters, in this time we're living in, you're going to have to possess your souls in patience. And you're going to have to be patient. And you're going to have to stop being antsy and making decisions under duress and pressure. Hello? Are you here? You're going to step back and get into peace and patience and make your positions and your stands and everything from that place and not under duress and not under pressure. Because it's going to cost you. Hello. We as a people, listen, don't, don't say no guts, no glory, and just jump into something. It's one thing if God's been dealing with you about something, and you won't do it. And you find, say, okay, Lord, I'll do what you say. I'm just going to do it. You know, live or die, sink or swim. I'm just going to do it because I know you've been dealing with me for six years to do it, and I'm finally going to do it. That's one thing. 
But be able to say, I don't know, I don't know, I can't tell you the Lord told me, but I just decided to do this. That's a dangerous, I say dangerous, so that's not a good place. It's not a good place. And I don't know all the, ram I can't tell you all the ramifications of something like that. I can't tell you, and I can't go, well, I can tell you one thing, this, this calls this, this, I can't tell you all that. But I can tell you that's not how, you, how you're led by the Spirit, and that's not how you live. We're to live according to, we're to live out of patience. And he has long patience. I said he has long patience. Listen, there's been things spoken over faith in Victory Church. By men and women of God, I trust and believe for years. I'm going to say, some of us have been thwarted because Satan got in some places and, and caused certain things to happen that set it back. Certain people have left in, in positions that were necessary. Certain people left in financial places that were necessary. And they were moved by the devil. Now I'm going to say they were possessed by the devil and they were demonized, they were demonized or anything. Satan got in there and got them on a track and they missed, and they missed out. And, it's, and it caused us as a church to be set back. Things that, and there are repercussions for those things. Hello? Mm -hmm. It causes, it causes a, a problem in the plan of God. And then God's got to go out and rework that. Well, you know, when you're dealing with people, sometimes you've got to rework it. It takes time. Because maybe somebody's not listening. Or somebody's happy where they're doing what they're doing and not interested in doing anything else. And he's got to rework that whole thing because somebody else didn't do what they were supposed to do. Yeah. That's why you've got to stay in patience, in peace, walk with God, walk in love. We've got to stay in love. Yeah, we do. Yeah. We do. Mm -hmm. you keep your heart in patience. It's so important to you, us as individuals, us as a church. We have to come back to a place where following after the heart of God. And I'm going to tell you something. Following after the heart of God is not going to be a constant, you don't have to do this, you don't have to do that, you don't have to do this, because I got this special plan for you and this special revelation for you. If you're following after the heart of God, you're walking according to that book right there. And what that book says is what you're walking after. Amen. Hello. Amen. There are things this church is to do. Yeah. There are things. There's this thing. There, there's some things on the horizon right now. <clears throat> there's a places of obedience I'm going to have to walk in. I'm praying them out. <laughs> About the church. Now listen, not leaving the church. Now you see, I just, I, I want to make sure that, because sometimes people can hear something, they might say, oh, he's going to be pastor, he's getting ready to leave. But he ain't told me I'm leaving. Okay? He ain't say, he say, he, he's not saying, I'm getting you ready and getting everything ready so you can leave. He ain't told me that. Nothing like that. But there's some things about the church and about, about the growth of the church and about some things in the direction of the church that he's talking to me about right now that, that we're going to have to walk in obedience to. And, and, and I'm, I'm waiting for him to tell me how to do it because I don't know how to do it. Mm. I'll just be honest with you. I don't know how to do it. I'm looking at it and I'm trying to figure it out. But until he tells me how, I ain't doing it. Because I could figure out a way probably. And you know what I had to say about that? No Ishmael's, yeah, N-I, no, not interested or no Ishmael's, thank you. <laughs> N-I, now means not, no Ishmael's. I like it. Yeah, instead of not interested. Hey Amen, I'm going to put that on Facebook today. Gina Curry has come up with a new uh, Facebook texting icon. Yeah, N-I means no Ishmael's instead of not interested. Yeah. Amen. But there are things that, that we have to walk in patience about. Listen, but I like to be at 3,000 people today after we've been here this number of years. Yeah! Sure. Love to have all the big buildings and all the money coming in that you, you you've, oh, we want to buy that whole village Bibles. We'll just buy them a whole other set for the next generation. Amen. You know, we're, just, we ain't, we're not going to take up an offer. We're not going to do it. We're going to write them a check. Right. Love to be there. In the natural, but you know what? Dad Hagen said something I heard on a, re on a tape recently, and I went, my God. He said the things he was teaching about faith then, at that time, that was probably in the 80s or whatever, and this was done. He said he learned in the first church he pastored and the last church he pastored. And both of them were, were, were churches they had to really work at. One of the churches he pastored, he told his wife every night, you know, if I didn't know the Lord told me to come here, that they, the deacon boy would come by the house tomorrow morning and the house would be empty and we'd be gone. We'd just pack up in the middle of the night and leave. 
He told that every night. He told that when they were, they were trying out for the church, preaching for them. He said, you know, if, if, the Lord, if I didn't know the Lord told me to come here, they'd wake up tomorrow morning. We would just slip out in the middle of the night and got in the car and drove off. They would just wonder where I was. But he said in those places is where he learned how to live by faith and, and to teach the things and to walk in the things he taught us and as a generations later. Hello? We have to walk and, and listen. I heard him preach it. Folks, we think that Dad Hagen lived like he, we saw him in the latter years. When you most of y'all saw him in his ministry. We think that's how he lived all the early part. Now, he lived the early part selling his car for junk because he couldn't get it repaired and it wasn't worth anything. It was worth more as junk than it was for him to keep it. Yeah. And he had to start riding the bus and hitchhiking to meetings. Preaching faith. Preaching God bless us. Preaching God's favor. Preaching God's healing. Sold his car for junk. Uh, if you really believe in prosperity, if you were really a prosperity preacher, if you really believe, had faith, you wouldn't be doing that. I think he had faith. What do y'all think? Yeah. Sold the car for junk. I mean, I just, that, just, that did something to me. And I don't know if it blessed me, mm -hmm. but it gave me insight. Sold the car for junk. <laughs> I know some of y'all sitting there thinking, I got a junk car sitting outside that barely runs on two cylinders out of four yeah. or six. Runs like a three-legged dog. Some cars run like a two-legged dog. Got the right, the left front and the right rear working. They're, they're, <laughs> they're always falling over trying to run. He stands against us so bad he just went to that found junkyard and sold it to them. They sold it for scrap metal. Melted it down. And that got him a little ways. We think he flew around on private airplane and, you know, and all that stuff, all those, all, we, we saw the latter end. I said, we saw the latter end. We didn't see him drawing names of companies they had to pay bills to out of a hat to see who they was going to get paid this week because they couldn't pay all the bills. But standing on the word and saying, my God supplies all my need. And drawing names out of a hat to figure out who's going to get paid because they can't pay everybody. Y'all here you go home. Oh yeah, it could be tough. But you've got to possess your soul in patience. You've got to stand your ground. You've got to follow after God and stop trying to figure it out with somebody, what somebody else is doing, how somebody else did it and get there and do it like they did it. Because they may have done it man's way and you're going to get the same result. They got a man's result. Let me say something. You can have five, I'm going to use a ministry example. You can have 5,000 people this week and in a year's time be totally out, gone, no church. This pastor in Tulsa did that. He got caught up in some things spiritually. Got invited by a bunch of homosexuals to come preach at their meeting. There's no such thing as a homosexual church. If there are a bunch of homosexuals getting together and saying they're worshiping God, they're liars. Amen. They need to repent yeah. and renounce that lifestyle and be born of the Spirit and be delivered from demonic oppression and suppression in Jesus' name. He went, they washed his feet. I bet they did. And he said they showed him more love. See, that's just the devil. I said, that's just the devil. They showed him more love than Christians. And so he, and before long, he was preaching universalism. Everybody's going to be saved. Everybody's saved. Doesn't matter if you're, if you're a homosexual, a Muslim, Hindu, everybody's saved. Church went from 5,000 to 200. Called in by people that, was, that he always referred to as his pastors. And they said, you're, you're on the wrong track. You're going, it's going to cost you. He wouldn't listen to them. They got him on a, question, on a television station and asked him, and he said, said, show us in the Bible where this is true. He said, I can't show you in the Bible where any of this is true. As a matter of fact, I can show you where everything I'm teaching and preaching is not in the Bible. He said, but I know it's true, even though the Bible says it's not. Today, he has no church. And he used to be a 5,000-member going and blowing church. At least everybody thought it was. We have to follow God. 
I said, we have to follow God. You stop looking at somebody else. You stop getting uptight because you're not where you think you ought to be right now today. Financially, socially, whatever. You get back to having a heart for God and God alone. Being tuned in to God. Can you say amen? Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the spirit. Thank you how you've led us today. We thank you that the people are going to be moved by your spirit to walk in that place you've called them. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Praise God. Well, we sure love you.